This is the top 10 hottest comics of the week based off of cover prices data. That is right. We are talking data. Cover price releases a top 10 hottest comics of the week on a Monday. Our show is live on Friday. What we like to do is look at this as a stock index or, or what have you. Uh, look at all these the, the top 10 books. And then Chris takes the three most interesting books off of that list each week and dissects them, breaks it down, and tells you why they're interesting and what he thinks overall about them. So before we get into Chris's three picks of the week, we are going to get into the top 10 hottest comics of the week. And obviously, we we want Roger's opinion as well. He's a very opinion opinionated person, and we like to hear what he has <laughs> to say. Top 10 hottest comics of the week are here we go. We at number 10, we have X-Men. 53, the first appearance of Onslaught. Man, I, I read why this book is hot, and now I can't even remember, Raj. I don't know if you remember, but uh, it is uh, – oh, Onslaught's coming back, I believe, in some way, shape, or form in a, a current storyline, so people are specking on this book. At number nine, we have Marvel Comics Presents 117, the first Wolverine versus Venom. Uh, pretty sweet Sam Keith cover as well. At number eight, it's Hardcore number one, the second print. Uh, but we saw – I cannot remember who had that 9.8 Hardcore. Great timing. Um, from Fresh from the Comic Shop. Number seven, Infamous Iron Man. Number one, first Doom is Iron Man and the first Tony Stark AI. I'm sorry, I had a burp there. At number six, we have Captain America. Number 16, the first Cynthia Schmidt as Sin, Red Skull's daughter. At number five, we have Bitterroot. Number 13, Sanford Green, Beat Street variant. Bitterroot, a lot of, th a lot of great things going on with that as well. At number four, we have Seasons Beating, the Margot J J J I can never pronounce his last name, but He's, got, he's a great artist. His variant. Uh, there's a lot of going on with this, and there's not much content other than it's a cool cover. Not much content in the guts of the book. Uh, number three is which is number one. Number two is Superman 10 Cent Adventure, the first appearance of a different version of Supergirl, CRL, which a lot of people are specking that she will be the, that version of Supergirl in The Flash. And at number one, we have the regular ver the, the cover A, Hardcore Number one, quite an interesting list this week, Chris. I'm okay. sure you're going to get into a lot of things as to why. Raj, what do you think about this list, this top ten list? Uh, I don't recognize it for nothing. Man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a lot of books like these are out of nowhere. Yeah, I mean, we, like what 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 makes a book like Witches all of a sudden be in the top ten again? I'll tell you, I'll this is why options. Scott, no, Scott Snyder tweeted that he's done with the script for Witches, but uh, nobody's. Yep. No, we don't know where it is in the in the process of development. We don't even know if it's picked up. I mean, maybe there's something out there years ago that they picked up. And this hardcore, you know, like what is this hardcore? Hardcore thing? is, Option. that's picked up, uh, that's a that's a Skybound book, a Robert Kirkman book that I do so, believe is optioned. Yes. So these no names yep. are just because they've been optioned and people are jumping yeah, on yep. them before they blow up too much. Exactly. Iron Man, uh, the infamous Iron Man is hot because of the Tony Stark AI, because everybody's assuming that Robert Downey Jr. will come back for right. the that one I know. Iron Heart show. Um, I mean, but Wolverine versus Venom, 117, uh, Marvel Comics, with, I don't know. Onslaught, I don't I don't really know. Anyways, but Chris knows. Chris yeah, knows Chris a knows. lot. <laughs> Chris, get into it. And we're, me and, me and Roger, yeah, are you know, on your, I, your theory, not on your theories, but on why people are just running out, rushing out to get this stuff. Go for right. it. Right. I, I do want to say, you know, I, I personally have stayed away. I always give a big shout out to independent books. Jeff, we've been doing this for over a year now. We know that if there's any type of talk about something being optioned with any type of independent book, it's it's most likely going to show up on this list. So kudos to that. But for me, it's kind of taking me away from picking those type of books because it's just it's it's almost redundant. Real quick, but, I do want to address one thing that Doug Bratton says. Hey, Raj, hashtag three men in the basement. But up, Dan brings up a quick question. I want to reiterate this. How do you base this top ten? We don't. It's cover price bases yep. off of sales data. Off of eBay, yep. Mercari, uh, what a, other a variety of other shops? I'm not sure, but there it's data on sales, yep. and th this data is is not accurate too. It's skewed because somebody could be paying fifty dollars for you know some fifty cent book out of nowhere, and all of a sudden that book is hot because it's rose the, the price is right, you know. So it's not a perfect system, but it's the and Chris and I opinion it's a, a, the, one of the best ways to track how hot books are is with this top ten list and these yep. these. These sales. So that's that answers the question. Wanted to get yeah. that out. Absolutely. And, and and it shows it shows you guys how we as a as a market, as consumers on the market, react to things, right? Um, we're I, we're never gonna get away to where we track the actual sales of books. Why? Because nobody's tracking actual LCS stores for mm -hmm. one, right? So, 
you know, you're never going to have an accurate top 10 list when it comes to actual sales data, but you have enough here to where we can look at how we're reacting on the market. And uh, yeah, so, so looking at my top three picks today, again, I try to go with different things that are interesting to me. All right. So my number three uh, pick on the list was X-Men number 53, the first uh, full appearance of Onslaught. This is uh, a really uh, fun pick for me because Onslaught recently reappeared in Way of X number two. All right. Now, before I talk about the book, let's look at the numbers. 130% increase in sales with a CGC high 9.8, $265. Decent money for a 90s book, mid-90s. Uh, this is a book that made it to the top list because of the comic books, right? The character showed up in a new X-Men book. Everyone's rushing back to say, ooh, Onslaught. Who? Maybe it's a new character saying, who is this Onslaught? I want to get the first appearance. Maybe it's older collectors like us that are like, oh, man, I remember collecting Onslaught in the 90s. I'm seeing him in Way of X. I'm going to go back and grab that first appearance. It's always exciting to me when books get hot because they're specific to what's going on currently in the comic books. And look, it's, you know, call it speculation, call it this and that, but it shows that people at least have their eyes and ears and head to what's going on in comic books right now. And it's not just about what's being optioned, what's going on in the movies and so forth. There's a lot of different collectors in this hobbies in it for different reasons. And we're looking at different factors. And uh, that's why I had to talk about this book because I think it's absolutely cool. I love, no, I, like it. I love it when a book is hot because of another comic. Yep. It's one thing when it's option. That's people who don't know comics jumping on something because they saw something on TV. Or if a movie comes out, a new character, a new TV show, that a lot of those sales are from people who don't know anything about comics, but they think that they can make money off of that speculation and buying that comic. When you have a comic that's hot because that character showed up in another comic, that means people read that book. Yep. I was just about to say that. I'm glad you brought that up. But like uh, that, it shows strength in the market as well when things like this happen. And we're seeing this a lot more frequently than not yeah. because there are a lot of new readers that have come into this hobby uh, in the past, I don't know, over a year because of the pandemic. And it's yeah. really nice to see something like this. So, Raj, 100% on what you said. I'm hoping we disagree on something soon. <laughs> Chris, what we did your, at the beginning of the show, but I, you know, I gotta, I gotta pull up. I, I saw, I saw some stuff about Sony and how you know you'll never trust. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. We can only hope. But Chris, what is your second most interesting pick from this list? All right, all right, second pick. Uh, keeping it Marvel, keeping it Marvel here. Captain America, number sixteen, and uh, man, is this volume six? I, it's hard to to keep track of which volumes it is. Um, but uh, this is the first appearance of Cynthia uh, Schmidt, the daughter of um, uh, Red Skull, uh, as Sin. Now, this book has been getting hot because, and, and you know what, I, I, I had a rough week and I meant to do some research on this, but there's speculation that she could be the villain in Captain America 4. Now, where that speculation's coming from, I have no idea. Uh, there's nothing that's been confirmed at all. We know almost nothing about uh, Captain America 4, except for who's going to be uh, directing and writing it. And, of course, that Anthony Mackie is the new cap, right? But check this out. 441% increase in sales and a CGC 9.8, 6 hundred dollars jeez wow okay now here's the thing i'm all about speculation um i will not say that i'm disagreeing with roger because roger did bring up a good point on the last book um about sometimes it's people that you know just see something on the tv show i won't sit and say you know roger i i, I like to look at it as a a broader perspective of things I can't just sit and say that it's people not wanting to that don't read comics or just want to make money. Um, I see it is the fact that people are just in tune to speculation. So in my opinion, what makes these books hot when there's speculation is that everyone jumps on it. The readers, the collectors, the people right. that want to invest, 
to people that want to speculate and flip. But once you get to a certain number too, um, the speculators kind of fall off because there's almost no wiggle room for them to make any money. So when a book like this hits a 9.8 and it's a $600 sell, you're like, man, somebody that wanted that book paid $600 mm -hmm. for it. It's absolutely yeah. crazy. Um, and I'm all for speculation. But it just go, it goes to show and you can look at all the variables and you can take it or leave it. But people are putting money in comic books. This is a a, a modern book that I mean, six hundred dollars for an I point eight. That's madness just on some speculation. It's crazy. That's the market. Yep, That's the market these days. And we're seeing crazy, crazy, like, you know, crazy prices going here that you never would have imagined. And. I don't know. It's kind of exciting. Raj, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, even for books that just a year ago were were peanuts. Mm -hmm. You know, look at the price of a uh, X-Men. Uh, of course, I'm going to forget the number of First Bishop. Mm -hmm. 282. Buy, I, I, yeah, they're, they go for like five, six hundred dollars right now. Nine point yeah, eight. A year ago, you could have bought that for less than a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, absolutely. and it's it's how about Spawn number one. Those are throwaway books a year or two ago. You know, now they're same thing. Four, five, six hundred dollars. People are paying for these things. It's and incredible. Like, so this market's so unpredictable. We'll see what starts happening when when people are able to spend their money elsewhere. When when things start opening up with the pandemic. So we'll see. A lot of people think that a bubble's going to burst. A lot of people think that this is going to continue on. Well, the Who thing knows? There are books that people want because it's, it's the drop off from a nine point eight to a nine point six on these books is incredible. So mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's someone saying, you know, I want. The first appearance of Bishop, but if I'm going to pay for it, I, I want a 9 8. Yeah. yeah. And that's another thing to really, that, that, and I've talked about this before. There's a market for 9.8s right now, and it's yeah. booming. And everyone, and you know, you look at like we got 90s books, modern books. Oh, print run, print run. No, no, no. Look at the census and look at how small of a number there are of 9.8 books on the census. Like this book right here, I guarantee you that the demand is extremely exceeding the supply of these books in 9.8s. Hey, plus it's a, a nice fully white cover, probably yeah. a bit harder to find in, in 9.8s. You got to keep in mind, the, the 9.8 market is a market in and of itself, and people yeah. are willing to pay that money. And what's the basic supply and demand? When demand exceeds supply, especially at this type of rate, that price is going to continue to go up because people are going to be willing to say, there's only a few out there. I want it. What do I need to pay to get it? Yeah, I agree. It's the 9.8 thing is, is real right now. Mm -hmm. You look at the amazing Spider-Man 252 and 9.8, you know, up almost three grand at this point. A 9.6 is like 600 bucks, 900 bucks or something like that. That's crazy. You know, people That's crazy. are going to pay good money for a book. They want a 9.8. Yeah, that's a crazy disparity. By the way, this goes along what we were talking about before. Miguel uh, Grassa, Marvel does seem to release new content on comics based on future movie content. That's so true because Kevin Feige runs the comic book. I mean, he's head of, of that whole division, so he's overseeing that. I don't know when he has time in the day to, to get into the nitty-gritty, <laughs> but I'm sure he's like, hey, down there, push this character, please. Yeah. Have them give them their own series. So keep an yeah. eye on that, guys. Definitely keep yep. an eye on, on what characters Marvel is pushing because yep. it's likely you, you may see them on the big screen. All right, Chris, yep. this has been fascinating, but this is it right here. Your last book of all right. The week. The most interesting pick off of this list. What do you Yeah, got? yeah, very, very yeah. interesting. Uh let me get some water in. Okay, uh, get it in. This is uh picked a DC book. Woo, DC? Uh, what yeah, show I is that? I know we haven't had a DC book in, in what? a while. <laughs> Are you sure this is comic book canon? All right. All right. Yeah. 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 We're sure. We're here. We're here. It's us. <laughs> All right. My number one pick. Superman 10 Cent Adventures number one. <laughs> All right. Cool cover. Cool cover. I like that cover there. Here it is with this book, guys. This is the first appearance of the version of Supergirl known as uh, Sorel. Uh, it is a... Uh, 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 official that she has been cast for the CW Supply Show. Uh, the actress has been uh, cast as well. Now, this book came out in 2003. All right. It's a modern book. Look at what this book did this last week 
487% increase in sales. That's probably because nobody was buying it <laughs> before this week. <laughs> um, and a high raw sold for 25 bucks. I mean, not, not, not an extreme amount of money. Um, obviously, you know, this book, it goes, there, there's no like CGCs on the market being sold or anything like that because probably, you know, a, a week ago, nobody was sending this book off to CGC or CBCS. <laughs> Here's my thing and, and why I picked this. And, and you guys know I pick stuff because it's interesting, not because, oh, it's the hottest book and you need to go out and buy it, right? I think it's very interesting because one, guess what? A CW show propped this book up. And I don't know about you guys, but between me and you, as someone who loved the first couple of seasons of Arrow, as somebody who loved the first couple of seasons of The Flash, the CW DC, DC shows have gotten so horribly bad that, I mean, I still try to watch them, but I, it's just, it's hard. I can't even pay attention to them. So it's, it's really interesting that this book still gains steam. So, you know, kind of going back to, you know, the points that Roger brought up about the first, first book, let's kind of play hypotheticals here on this one. What is driving the popularity of these books, of this book? Are people actually watching CW shows and they want to, you know, be interested about the character in the comic book? Maybe, maybe some people. Um, or are we just keeping our ears to news and we hear casting calls and all this stuff when it comes to all these things? And it's either, you know, this is speculators or it's the investors or the hobbyists that just feel like they have to have the FOMO because there's been an announcement of a casting in a live action. My guess it's still all of the above. But the thing with this book specifically, and I'm going to make kind of a, a crystal ball prediction on this. I know that, that the high raw being sold for $25 isn't that much money. I am going to predict that maybe a couple months from now or after the season of the flash or who knows what happens if the character is going to be around next season. I, I don't know. This book is going to be back in the bargain bins. <laughs> so, you know, it's uh, it's just one of those things that um, I'm all about. I'm all about the connectiveness of, Folks that watch the movies and the TV shows and, and want to learn about these characters and go to the comic books. I'm all about the films and the TV shows bringing folks our age that can see these comic book characters that we grew up with on the pages be brought to life on screen. And I'm all about a healthy amount of FOMO when it comes to wanting to spec and getting like, like I do my top tens on my channel. The top 10 Doctor Strange spec books you know, ones that aren't really on people's radar. You know, maybe the Dark Holds coming in that Doctor Strange um, Volume 2, number 60, which is like the origin of the of the Dark Hold and how it has to do with vampires. We know that vampires are coming in the MCU. We just seen the Dark Hold in WandaVision. Okay, let's go get a copy. I'm all for that stuff. And then when we see him on screen, I'm, we're like, yes, and look, I got my copy. You know, you show it up. <laughs> I'm all for it. But this is just one of those situations where I don't, think cw in whatever they're doing with their characters on their shows is gonna hold any weight so that's why i said we don't do the top 10 because we want to talk about what's hot for you to be on your app and you know go on ebay and buy everything we're talking about we're here to talk about why they're interesting and i'll tell you what this book is absolutely interesting uh i don't care about it i don't think i own it and i don't ever care to own it unless Maybe it was as the title sent a 10 cent adventure that I would pay 10 cents for. <laughs> That's just me. You're muted. I'm done. <laughs> I'm muted because my dogs are snoring, but I would love Roger's take on this. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that we've seen over the, and I completely agree with the first one to like four seasons of every show WB did. Uh, they were great. The writing was great. And then it was just like second verse, same as the first. 
Yeah. Had one bad guy for the entire season. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the same thing happened over and over again. All of a yep. sudden, like, Arrow, all of a sudden, everybody's a superhero. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know like, everybody who puts on a mask is, is, a, is a superhero. And I, and I think that mis- and I, I think that hurt some of the newer WB shows because I didn't watch Star Girl for that reason. I'm like, I'm so sick and tired of Flash. I'm sick and tired of Arrow. I don't know where they're going with this. I watched Supergirl. That got stupid, you know, and, but, I think to your point, those characters didn't blow up. They did for they went from a dollar book to a twenty five dollar book. But I think the same thing is said true about the DC movies. I mean, look at look at yeah. the, look at the first appearance yep. of Doomsday. Yep. I mean, what did it, what was that? A fifty dollar book after he showed up in the movie? If you got what like the fifth print or whatever was the hard one to find, and that's a ten dollar book again. Like mm-hmm. you, you know, that's a that's supposed to be a huge character, and they even brought him back in. Uh, uh, Krypton, the, the the TV show, which uh-huh. I don't know where that is because that's one of my favorite shows to come out in the last that was a know, good show. decade. And I absolutely loved it. And they brought them back there, and it still did nothing. You know, like DC is in general, like yep. for even the first appearance of Dark Side is an affordable <clears throat> book right now. You know, after all the hoopla with the Snyder Cut, still an affordable yep. book to get. So I think DC in general. So yep. I agree with you. That book, you know, once whatever happens in the TV show happens, that's going to be a ten set book again. Look, look, Chris and I talk about this on the regular about DC. There is no strategy. There is no, there's no leadership to instill. Like, there's no leadership that can guide the creative to create. They're yeah. they're meddling. They're contradicting each other. They're making absolutely no it's sense because their shows and t- everything goes in their own direction. Not only their shows, their movies too. That's what I mean. The look, movies and the shows. There's look no continuity. What the executives say okay. they contradict each other. They have they're making no. Chris and I. Went off on a rant a couple months ago on what Hamada was saying about something that completely contradicted what they said in uh, DC fandom. It's garbage. And I, I'll yeah. be Kamigazi brings up an amazing point. There's no true guidance with DC movie and TV. In my honest opinion, and that's Chris and I talk about this each and every week. Yeah. That we're we're actually offended at how these characters have been treated, how this universe has yeah. been treated. Because growing up, those are my favorite characters, yes. and they've done nothing in the movies. It's been such a disappointment. Disappointment and and just I mean there's been a few decent ones here and there but it's it's been a majority disappointment and just straight garbage straight yeah. garbage. Let, let me let me bring in Star Wars as an example of how the live action right and being able to take those type of properties in the connect uh, connectivity of it all that Marvel's done so successful right. Look at look at what. Look at what 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 Disney has been doing with Star Wars now, even with the animated stuff. And the connectivity matters because we can watch Mandalorian, and then you know we got Ahsoka out of it. We know she's coming. Yeah, we know we're getting a um, Obi Wan show, where Obi Wan is obviously connected to the. It's all in the same universe. But even even Clone Wars, even the Bad Batch. These are animated shows that exist within, you know, they're they're telling stories of filling the holes in the same universe that's connected that we love. And Absolutely. when it comes when now and look at the hype around the Star Wars comic books. There's something there when it all can be connected. We get pulled into the characters even more, we get pulled into the universe even more. And it does something to us as comic book fans. And when you when you have a property in a franchise like Star Wars that started in the movies and then went to comic books, yeah. Yet we are still having this this uh, interlocking uh, uh, connectedness between the comics and the movie universe. It speaks to something, and DC just cannot do it. They and they haven't and. Honestly, at this point, at least maybe in our lifetimes, I don't know if they ever will. And to, and to and kind of help jump on that point with Star Wars, so I don't know if you, I'm a, I've become a big Star Wars guy, and uh, I've gone back and I've started reading like the novels. I just finished the Thrawn trilogy and oh, nice. and all that stuff. You know, I read the Light of the Jedi before I started reading the High Republic books, which actually helps the comics make more sense, even though you don't need it. But the first episode of The Bad Batch, when I went to work, the first thing we all talked about around the cooler was that they saw Ezra Bridger as a kid. I mean, uh, Kanan. 
Kanan as a little kid. That was awesome. The way they crossed the two shows instantly, and everybody recognized how genius that was. That you saw Kanan, and you found out why he was all by himself, and what you know what happened. Until then, and I watched all the Clone Wars. I've gone back and watched the last last season of Clone Wars three times. Mm. I've watched Rebels. You know, I was I'm a huge uh, Sabine and Ahsoka fan. I cannot wait to see the two of them together in a show. I just had a commission done with the two of them on the cover. But to have that all kind of, and you put the Bad Batch, and you're like, wow, they just had Kanan on there. That was that's that's amazing. Like I didn't even realize where in the continuity of Star Wars the Bad Batch was until that first episode when they actually showed Kanan and showed that the Bad Batch saved him. And that's what actually there was their demise as far as being kicked out, like being called traitors or whatever. Sorry, spoiler if you hadn't seen them, but we are on like episode four or five, so get with it. But you're right, that continuity it was is genius the way they intertwined them. And in every show, there's an intertwine between Rebels and Clone Wars and, and the Bad Batch. That, that if you saw those, you're like, holy crap, I remember when it happened in the other show. But they're using these kind of tools uh, in their back pocket to kind of. Not only inform you, it's like, hey, here's the timeline, by the way, but do it in a creative way that entertains you. That's like, shit, there's there's Kanan, right? That's it's it's incredible, and that's why I like the connectivity. I I, I truly enjoy it, and I know I, I know bottom tier collector. I think he's AK. He used to be the bearded one. Uh, not everything needs to be turned into a movie franchise. There's beauty in things that stand alone, like Nolan Batman. We don't need a connected universe for DC movies to be good. I, I, you, you, it doesn't need to happen to be good, but it is. They need to make that, a good movie. Yeah, yeah but we're all hey. comic book, yeah, they need a good movie to start with. But <laughs> right, we're all comic book fans here. We grew yep. up with these connected universes, with these characters just yep. literally jumping from title to title. That's something yep. that again we take for granted with the MCU. How hard this is to do. What Kevin yep. Feige and all of the creatives have done there with the log- I say this every week with the logistics of production. Not only not only hiring actors that have the availability to be able to interconnect it and sign on to these films, but getting the producers, the writers, all of the creatives intertwined together to create this plan has never been done before, and it's not easy. And DC just assume that these characters are so lovable, every, anybody will come and, and, and yeah. check this shit out, right? So let's yeah, just yeah. try and create a connected it's universe. Wet, wet toilet paper, throw it against the wall and see oh, if it's Oh, my safe. goodness. They didn't know how hard it really was, and yeah. the proof is in the pudding. To bottom tier's point here, though, uh, he's it's it. Th- there's a reason about what I'm talking about, though. I agree 100 with your statement, bottom tier. Um, you don't need a connected universe to make a good Batman movie. You don't need a connected universe to make a good Spider-Man movie. You don't need a connected universe to make a good Captain America movie, and so forth. But the reason that comic book lovers are going back to comic books as much as they are for these characters is directly correlated to the mm-hmm. success of a successful connected universe that's my point so d- look at look at the the Nolan trilogy what did that do what did that do and i know you know say for example the Nolan trilogy came out post um MCU right which which it 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 did i mean at least one of the films um and then one of them came out right when it was getting started but if it got started like after we were some years deep into the mcu maybe there would have been a different impact because we already saw how the mcu um uh uh was impacting collectors to get back to the books but raz al ghul's first appearance didn't skyrocket because we saw we saw him, uh, Liam Neeson play him in a movie. Bane's first appearance. And by that time, there was talk. And I remember there was talk. Oh, Bane, you know, but it, it didn't do anything to Bane's, uh, m- much to Bane's first first appearance that, that's noticeable. Um, y- you know, those films still didn't really impact the comic book market yeah. like the MCU connected universe has or even you know, in the more recent past, the Star Wars connected universe under the Disney and MCU plus umbrella uh, has done over the last two years. So there's and, something to say with how comic book fans connect, pun intended, to a connected cinematic universe. Yeah. And on top of that, if DC came out 
and made movies that were not connected whatsoever and were made well, I'd be okay with that. But they did connect them. They we did, we're not connecting them. They did that. When they brought together the Justice yep. League and they had all these, they're the ones who said, well, Marvel did it. We have to do it. If they yep. came out and made an Aquaman, a Wonder Woman, you know, a Batman, a Superman, and none of those were connected and none of those characters are connected and they gave us a good villain, which is what DC sucks at. You need a good villain to make a good movie. If you gave us a good villain with a good storyline, I don't need to see Wonder Woman's boyfriend in parachute pants. We're going we're gonna to consume that and we're going to like it. But DC said, we're going to make these movies, and we are going to connect them, and they did it terribly. I'm, we're going to end on that point for uh, Hottest Comics, uh, Top 10 Hottest <laughs> Comics. That is the Top 10 Hottest Comics of the Wait, week. Wait, are we still on that? <laughs>